All right, today we're going to talk about the Genesis account. So you're going to want to follow in your Bible in Genesis chapter 1. So I'm going to have a lot of, a lot of it on the screen for you today. And we're going to go through some details. So you're going to need to pay attention to word choices, phrases that are repeated, and the significance. On the quiz on Thursday, you'll be able to have your Genesis account open. <coughs> All right, so that means you're going to have to tell me more about it, not just rewrite what you see in front of you in the Genesis account. So I want you to pay attention to the idea of significance. <coughs> We're going to go through this account in detail. What is the significance of God choosing to use his name Elohim? What does that show about him? What does Elohim's name mean? I asked that today. Elohim's <coughs> name literally is the strong and mighty ones. What's the significance about that? There's several things. The first thing is that it's plural. What's the significance that God chose a plural name for himself? What's the significance that it has to do with God's strength? Remember, there's two things about God's strength. His governmental authority and his ability to keep, make and keep promises. So both his physical power and his governmental authority and his ability to keep and make promises. So as we go through this, we are going to spend a lot of detail on it. I want you to know what you believe about creation and why you believe it. And I want you to see how very specific the Genesis account is. Remember, and the rest of the class today, we're gonna to talk about the actual days of creation. Remember, learn it in detail, understand what you believe about it and progress beyond the Sunday school lesson of what happened on the, this day, what happened on that day. Think about the significance of the order of creation. Think about everything that's in there. It has a significance. As we mentioned last class period, I, I think and I know you believe that the Bible is inspired, every word. And remember, keep thinking about it as being very deliberate. The word choice is deliberate. The wording of the Bible is deliberate. It's not just inspired, not just the ideas for sure, but the words, so pay attention to that. Okay. Um, I have lost control of the, what is the issue today? All right, so the first thing that we want to review, we mentioned this, and a lot of this will overlap because it is important, right? The Genesis account is a historical narrative. How do I know that? First thing we're going to pay attention to before we go through the actual wording of the Genesis account <coughs> is we're going to pay attention to the style of writing. All right, the style of writing. And then we want to see where it's found in the rest of Scripture, many references to it, and then direct validation by Jesus Christ. We're going to see that in sermons or in conversations, in the New Testament, Jesus refers to creation just as if it's a historical event like any other historical event. So the style of writing, the style of writing is not Hebrew poetry. And again, we mentioned this on Thursday, but what's, why are we going through this in such detail? And that's because many so-called Bible scholars or maybe some Christians and so forth, different people are, are going to try to fit the creation account into science, try to fit the Bible into science, and that's backwards, remember? We start from the Bible and we fit science into the Bible, not vice versa. So the only reason to think that the Genesis account is literal, not literal, the only reason to think that the Genesis account might be allegorical is because we think, oh, Science has proven the earth is 4.5 billion years old. So I have to fit that, I have to fit scripture into what science has proven. Well, that's not the case. Science has not proven the age of the earth. And we're not gonna try to fit the Bible into science. We're gonna fit science into the Bible. And it's really not that difficult. So it is not Hebrew poetry. Let's think about English poetry for a minute. Not one of my favorite things, probably not one of yours either, especially if you're given an assignment to write something. When you're given an assignment to write something in English class that's poetic, what are you looking for? 
Well, English poetry is def defined by the delivery of its pronounced sounds, <coughs> right? And it's in English poetry is defined by its sound. We're looking for rhyming, correct? And it's defined by its format. If you're familiar with Shakespeare's sonnets and so forth, English poetry is defined by its format and it's very dependent on the delivery of its pronounced si sounds. Okay, when you think about English verse, it relies on rhyme, okay? And then it's also very dominated by sound. You've heard of different meters of English poetry and so forth. So when we're talking about Hebrew poetry, it's different. Hebrew poetry is not defined by sound or by format. It's defined more by format. Hebrew poetry is noticed by parallelism, in particular parallelism of meaning. Okay, as we mentioned this before, this is the second time we've talked about this. It's significant. All right, the style of writing in the Genesis account is not at all in poetry format. It lacks the parallelism of meaning that characterizes Hebrew poetry. So do you understand that? It's not Hebrew poetry. The style of writing is all wrong. And Hebrew poetry is different than English poetry. And when we hear English poetry, we immediately recognize it by its sound <coughs> and its formatting, correct? That's not true with Hebrew poetry. We're not looking for rhyming, especially not when it's been translated from Hebrew to English. What we look for to recognize Hebrew poetry in the Bible is we look for that parallelism of meaning. The other thing that we will look for is pairs or triplets of similar meaning or pairs and triplets of contrasting meaning, like in the book of Proverbs. Okay, that's in Hebrew poetry style. Is the Genesis account in this style? Not at all. So the style of writing prohibits the Genesis account from being called poetry. Okay, it is written without the parallelism of meaning. The next thing is that the Genesis account has the style, not of poetry, but of prose. Okay, so that means that the Genesis account is a historical narrative. It's giving the sequence of actual events. It's not <coughs> allegorical. So it's not poetic and it's not allegorical. It lacks the informational parallelism of poetry and it is written in the style as a sequence of events. And then you see the third reason there is that it has a time context. So it's not poetry, it's not allegory, it's prose. It is a historical narrative and this is noticeable in the style of writing. And the only reason that we're gonna say otherwise is because we're trying to make the Bible fit science. We're making a compromise. All right, on face value, it's not poetry, it's not allegory, it is a historical narrative, and it's written <coughs> as Hebrew prose, not Hebrew poetry. Then we can see it confirmed throughout Scripture. It's referenced numerous times in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see reference to it right away we see a reference to the creation account in the book of Exodus. We see the fact that when the uh, law is given and we're talking about the Sabbath, Sabbath we're ref we go back and we reference creation. And this is done frequently. And even more so in the New Testament by both Christ and by Paul. That Christ will refer to the book of Moses, Moses and the prophets. So the creation account is no different than the rest of the writings of Moses, and it's no different than the rest of the writings of the Old Testament, Moses and the prophets. Paul refers back to it in particular. And we know that marriage was established based on Genesis chapter 2. Okay, so, and we know that the Hebrew law of the Sabbath was established based on the creation week. So this is a literal account and it's well established in the Bible. 
Then we have some direct validation by Christ when he is um, speaking or when he is um, having a conversation. You can see I've got a reference there from each one of the books of the New Testament. We've got Matthew 19, we've got Mark chapter 10, Luke chapter 17, and John chapter 5. Let's pick one in the middle. How about Mark chapter 10? So if you would take a look at Mark chapter 10. And here Christ is talking about marriage and divorce. All right, so, and he's referring back to the fact that marriage was established by God in Genesis chapter 2. In Mark 10, he's having a discussion with Pharisees. All right, and then he, in verse 3, he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? Talking about divorce. And they answered, and they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of a divorcement and put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of hearts he wrote you this precept. And here's verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Probably heard that referenced in marriage ceremonies frequently. But here, this is a direct validation by Christ of Genesis 1, 2. Genesis chapter 1 in particular, Genesis chapter 2. So the creation account is not some allegory, some story, some myth, or whatever you want to call it. It is part of the historical record found in the book of Genesis. Now here's where I want to, you to turn back to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to go through some significant things in the account itself, and we're going to go through each day in the account itself. So Genesis chapter 1, let's look at the account itself, and I want to list, and I want you to pay attention to some very important repetitions. The first one is and. Now if you take a look at the Genesis account, I think it's around 60 sometimes is the conjunction and, and it's used in a couple different ways. Now Hebrew is a very distinct language, very different language. Of course you know that they read from right to left instead of from <coughs> left to right, so they read it backwards. And their conjunction and is used as a prefix. It's not a separate Hebrew word. So um, it's a single letter stroke that's put as, that's used as a prefix, which means it's put at the end of the word. So it's kind of hard to distinguish this. It's a prefix, and it's used several different ways. One way that it is used is as a consecutive. It kind of, in English, has the connotation of, and then. So as we go through the Genesis account, I want you to pay attention to all of the ands. And the significance here is that this and indicates that this is a sequence of events. Earlier we said that this is not Hebrew poetry, this is Hebrew prose, and one of the reasons it's not that it is prose is that it has a sequence of events. So it's Hebrew prose. It is a historical narrative. So I want you to pay attention to how many ands there are, particularly at the beginning of each verse. Look at the Look at the account as you go through it. How does each verse begin? And, all the way verses 1 through 26, they all start with and. And then we see another conjunction in verse 27. So, but other than verse 27, all of the verses in the Genesis account begin with this conjunction. It is the conjunction of sequence. It is a prefix. Okay, then you're going to notice, repeated numerous times in the Genesis account, you're going to notice, and God said. So that would kind of, in English, we, it is translated, and God said. The connotation there is going to be, and then God said, and then God said, and then God said. And what's the significance of God said? That gives us the mode 
or the mechanism, I guess, of creation. How did God create? I asked you on the quiz. Literally, by the word of God, or by his spoken command. It's the same thing, by the word of God. Okay, so this is important. It shows the mode of creation, and it also shows the power of God's word. Another phrase that you're going to see repeated is the phrase um, that it was good. It's at the end of, or in the, towards the end of every day, you'll see, and God saw that it was good. This has the idea of not only goodness, but also wholeness, completeness, and maturity. So creation, God saw at the end of every day that everything he had created or made was good. Evening and morning, what's the significance of this repetition? At the end of every day, we see the phrase, and the evening and the morning were the first day, and the evening and the morning were the second day. What's the significance of this? It's a solar day, correct? We're going to see this repeated throughout the account. So this gives us a time context, doesn't it? So if you look back in your notes, you should have three reasons why we know this is Hebrew prose, not poetry. What's the first reason? That it's the style of writing, right? Why is it Hebrew prose? What about the style of writing? You can tell me that it's the style of writing, but what about it? Yes. Anybody know? Yep. What? Okay, it's a sequence of events and a time con and a time context. But what's the first reason? It lacks the parallelism. So there are three reasons why we know that this is a historical narrative. It's written as Hebrew prose. First reason is it lacks the parallelism that's required for poetry. It is a sequence of events, and then it has a time context. Well, here's the time context. At the end of every day, it says the evening and the morning. That means that there was a period of day and a period of darkness. It was, there was a daytime and a nighttime, a daytime and a nighttime. What does that mean? 24-hour solar day. So this is a significant repetition as well. And it was so. We see this several times. So we're going to be looking for this one. And this is a direct repetition several times that will indicate the power of God's word. He spoke and it happened. And it was so. So this is a repetition that has a significance. What is the significance of the repetition, and it was so? It shows the power of God's word. So what are the significance? Things that we're going to be looking for as we go through the passage here in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be looking for the prefix, and, though it's translated as a separate word, you won't find it in Hebrew. We're going to be looking for, and God said. We're going to be looking for, that it was good, and God saw that it was good. We're going to be looking for, and the evening and the morning, we're going to be looking for, and it was so. That gives us the indication, its significance is the power of God's word. Another thing we're going to see with respect to plants and animals. After its kind, after their kind, after his kind. What is the significance? And it's repeated, it looks like it's repeated a little too much. It kind of makes the reading of it a little bit clumsy. So that means there's a reason for it. Okay, we're going to see this, and I'm calling it the variation barrier. All right. Keep in mind, as a creationist, we don't discount variation within kind, do we? But there, there is variation. Look at all the different kinds of dogs, but that's not the right way to put it. They're all in the same kind. So we're going to see a lot of variation within what's known as biblical kind. So, but we don't cross that kind. We never can see a change from one kind into another. So that's kind of a border. It's a barrier. So evolution between kinds is not possible, even though we will have variation within kinds. That's what I mean by the variation barrier. See it there. Okay, so as we go through this, I want you to be looking for those repetitions.
So let's start with day one. You'll notice day one is found in Genesis 1, 1 through 5, and you can see in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and there's the first and. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Do you see the repetitions there? Do you see the conjunction and, which is stringing those events together in sequence? That and is the Hebrew conjunction of sequence. So this is a sequence of events. It is not poetry. All right, so Genesis 1 and um, verses 1 through 5. Notice I have created in green. That is the Hebrew verb bara. What is the significance of the Hebrew verb bara? Remember, we use the word create in English a lot looser than it means in Hebrew. What is the significance of bara? Yes? It's only used when the subject is gone. That's true. It's only used when the subject of, is God, and that significance, what else? It has the connotation of out of nothing, but that's New Testament. That's Greek, the ex nihilo. <coughs> but what create means is bring into existence. Okay, if we want to make it more specific of how it's used in Hebrew, we would think of it as bring into existence. So in verse 1, what did God do? He created the heaven and the earth. That means he brought it into existence. So that is significant. Day 2, how does it begin? It begins with the conjunction of sequence. What's the next thing? It gives us how God created. He spoke literally by the literally by the Word of God. Okay, what's the doctrine of creation? That, what? Direct spoken commands of God. And you can see that. And also on day two, do you see the word create? No. God did not create anything on day two. He organized and formed. Right? And But then we see the first and it was so in day two, the power of God's word. You can see that. Um, and it was so. Right at the end of verse 7 before we get to verse 8. So you notice all the conjunctions linking this together. And you see the power of God's word. He spoke and it was so. Day 3, verses 9 through 13 are the third day. There's all the conjunctions. And God said. And God said. Verse 11. Also on day 3, we see another. And it was so. All right. And then we see the first time the phrase and um, that it was good. Because remember, creation was created complete and mature. God created trees, not seeds. God created fully formed trees and plants. And so that's why this is the first time we see it, is in day three in particular, because it's important. On day two, we're dealing with the firmament and the waters. Nothing to really be complete or mature there, but on day three, we're dealing with plant life. So plants were created complete, mature. They weren't created as seeds or even seedlings. They were full, fully grown trees and other plants. Also in lighter green there, you can see after his kind. It says and um, verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass. There's the conjunction prefix again, and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. All right, so we have tree mentioned there specifically, so we know creation was created mature, but we also see after his kind repeated. That's because plants do not evolve. There's a barrier of variation. There's a lot of variety in the plant kingdom, but that variety never crosses the kind barrier. We never have one type of plant evolving into another. Even though we have a lot of different varieties of plants, 
and different varieties of trees, we never can evolve into another type of plant. And notice, talking about the seed, whose seed was in itself. Well, one of the main categories of plants are called angiosperms, right? Covered seed, where the seed is in the fruit. So even our early uh, classification of biology was not based on evolution. It was based on creation. So that is day three. Here's day four, verses 14 through 19, cover day four. And we see a lot of the same thing. In day four, of course, is um, the, the formation of the astrosphere. Do you see the word create in day four? No, it's not there. God did not create the sun, moon, and stars. He formed them from materials he had already created. Okay, there is no word create there. He used the matter and energy he had already created on day one, formed and organized the astrosphere. Okay, if we go back to day three, you didn't see the word create in there either because God, we talk about the plant biosphere and we can talk about the lithosphere. The lithosphere, lithos means rocks. The lithosphere would be the dry ground wasn't created, it was formed from matter already created on day one. The plant biosphere was not created, it was not brought into existence, it was formed from matter already created. Same thing on day four. Day five, verses 20 through 23, you can see here we've got the conjunction of sequence throughout. We have the context, evening and the morning were the fifth day. At the end of this section, we see, and it was good because animals were also um, formed fully. They were fully formed and complete and mature. But we see in verse 21, this is only the second instance of the word create. Look at verse 21, and God created. That is the second use of the verb bara. So God brought into existence another entity on this day, and this is the life consciousness that belongs to animals, and also will, of course, when we get to day six, will also be uh, part of man's makeup. Okay, this is a creative act. God brought into existence a consciousness that is possessed by both animals and man. Okay, plants do not have this. So in biology class, biology defines life differently than God does. So God does not truly consider plants to be alive. In the original creation, plants were used for food and animals were not. There's a reason for that. All of that changed after the fall of man. So everything that we see around us requires us to believe in creation. It also requires us to believe in the fall of man and it also requires that we believe in the flood. Those three events, all in the book of Genesis, have shaped the world that we have today. Okay, so, of course, first and foremost in this class, we're going to deal with creation. And notice, God also repeats um, after his kind with respect to the fish and the fowl. So on day five, the first thing that happened is the creative act of life consciousness. But then God also formed the physical bodies of the fish and the birds. But fish and birds are different from plants. They have a consciousness, okay? Um, which is why the, um, the Bible later on says that the righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. So animals do have a life consciousness. They feel pain and so forth. And so God requires the Christians to treat animals with um, not with cruelty, but that's where we get the word humane. We treat them humanely. So there's no such thing as plants being harmed. You've heard of the probably the environmental term tree hugger. That has no biblical basis. Plants were given by God for human and animal use and consumption. Okay, so 
Not that I believe in animal rights either, and we'll talk about that in a minute. There's no such thing as animal rights either. All right, so let's go to day six. On day six. Notice here we are again with the conjunction of sequence. Here we are again with the mode or mechanism of creation. God spoke. And also we see repetition here with the variation barrier. We see after his kind. If we start here for day six, we're at verse 24, and God said, Let the earth bring forth living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. There's the power of God's word. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Okay, so here we have also, especially with animals, Evolution, of course, is very active, explaining how eventually man evolved from the animal kingdom and how we had a, some type of common ancestor. And we have all these different branches evolving in the animal kingdom. Well, so God repeated how many times the variation barrier just here in this, on this day? After his kind, after their kind, after its kind. All kinds of repetition there because it's significant. Variation is limited. That's the significance of after his kind being repeated. <coughs> All right, there is a barrier. Variation is limited. It's limited to within the created kinds in Genesis chapter 1. So there's day 6. And you'll notice here is the third and, and fourth use of the word create. So we have a third creative act. This is the creation of man's spirit. All right, you probably have heard that there's three parts to your being, your physical body, <coughs> your living soul, and then your eternal spirit. Sometimes we use the word soul and spirit incorrectly. Animals have a soul, but what animals lack that man was given on day six that God created specially is man has an eternal spirit. Okay, so yes, man has the physical body. Yes, man has the life consciousness. He is a living soul. But then he has a third component. He has an eternal spirit. Okay, animals do not have an eternal spirit. Animals cease to exist when they die. That is not true of human beings, and that's because God gave us an eternal spirit, and this is what the Bible is referring to when it says that God gave us His image. How do we know that? The Bible tells us that God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So the part that makes you different from animals is the fact that you were created, and that's the proper verb, you were created in God's image. So what's the significance here? Okay, yes, we have a soul because we have a consciousness, we feel pain, we have a mind, but we also have a spirit. And that's the part of our human nature that communes with God. That's the part of our human nature that is eternal. Okay, so we have a third creative act that distinguishes man from the animal kingdom. So. There is no such thing as animal rights because animals do not have an eternal spirit. They are not human. And this is another problem for evolutionists to explain. All right, now we're going to go back to Elohim because it's significant. Okay. Who is, or maybe I should fix that, who are the creators? The answer is Elohim. God introduced himself with this name, okay? And it is significant that he chose to use this name. All right, here is the actual Hebrew. The God of creation is Elohim, the strong and mighty ones. Here's it written in passage. You'll notice the little dots underneath. I thought that was interesting. That tells someone who can read Hebrew, tells them how to pronounce the words. 
So remember, as review, what is the significance of God choosing to, to name himself Elohim when he was talking about creation? Elohim, the strong and mighty ones, refers to his strength and his ability. His strength, we're referring to both physical power and governmental authority. The idea of authority is key. Why is belief in evolution so dangerous? Because it takes God's authority away from him. On quiz one, that's what I was looking for primarily on number eight. Okay, how does this affect your view of God? Well, yes, a lot of atheists believe in evolution, but more than even people who aren't atheists, it still destroys God's authority. All right, and that's because Elohim refers to his strength, not only of of course, that he could bring these things into existence and form and make them, but that's physical power, but also his governmental authority. But then the power of his word. God has the ability to make and keep commandments. So Elohim is significant. And as we're going through the Genesis account, you'll notice that throughout this chapter in Genesis, we don't see the other names for God. We see just God. So when you see the name God by itself in English, that is Elohim. Other names of God will say Lord God or just Lord. There's other ways that you will see God in Hebrew. Okay, and then here's the word choice. Another review, another repetition here. I'm repeating it because it's significant. There's the Hebrew conjunction of sequence, the prefix. All right, and that has the connotation of and then it's giving us a sequence of events. Bara, Yasa, or Asa, and Yatza. Those are three verbs. Bara is translated create in the Genesis account, and it has the connotation of bringing from something into existence. Uh, made has the idea of to do in Hebrew to organize, to put together. Formed is a little more specific, yatsar. Formed has the idea of molding like clay, shaping and fashioning. And this verb is only used on day six, having to deal, and it's only found in chapter two, dealing with the formation of the man's physical body and the formation of animals. It's kind of interesting. Nefesh. That's translated soul in chapter 2, and that has the idea of breathing creature, vitality. I called it a life consciousness, okay? So we're going to see that, all right? And so very significant in this section is Elohim, okay? All right, so let's go through the days of creation. You should still be in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to go through each day and I'm going to review again word choice, but through this lecture I want you to concentrate on formative acts, creative acts, and governmental acts. So we're going to progress and we're going to get away from Sunday school and we're going to make sure we understand what happened on every day. Okay, so there are three kinds of acts I want you to be on the lookout for. Creative acts, formative acts, and governmental acts. Now governmental acts, the last one that we have there, that has the idea of establishing. You'll notice there'll be governmental acts of establishing day and night, governmental acts of establishing genetic law, governmental acts of establishing seasons and time frames. Those are governmental acts. So they're kind of separate. So the next thing I want you to pay attention to is the difference between creative acts versus formative acts. The first way I want to contrast them is the verbs. Creative acts are unique to the <coughs> verb bara, whereas formative acts can use either verb asa, made, or yatsar, formed. The next thing is that creative acts, the word create, has the idea of bringing into existence. Okay, you should already understand that. I feel like I'm repeating a lot. It's important and it is detailed. 
whereas formative acts have the idea of organizing, putting together, molding even from material that is already in existence. As mentioned, bara is only ever used in the Bible with deity as the subject. God, or possibly one of the other names for God could be used, but only deity or God is the subject. These other verbs in the Bible, are they're found throughout the Bible, and sometimes God can be the subject, or even human beings, different people in the Bible. They're more commonly spaced throughout the rest of the Old Testament. In the creation account, there's only three and very specific creative acts, only three of them, three very specific creative acts, numerous, numerous formative acts. So you need to be able to distinguish between creative acts and formative acts. What are the verbs used for each one? What is the connotation of those verbs? And then who uses those, who do we use those verbs with respect to as the subject of the sentence? Creative act number one is the origin of matter and energy. You will need to know these three creative acts. The first one is found, and they're found in the Genesis account specifically with the verb bara, the verb in English create. So this is the origin of matter and energy. It is the physical aspect of creation. God brought the physical universe into being, matter and energy, kind of the raw materials of creation. And of course, this is day one. And you can find it very easily by looking for the verb create in the Genesis account. The last thing on the slide there you see is that it answers a very fundamental question and this question is important because evolution really has no answer for it, and we have an easy answer for it. If we ask the question, where did matter come from? A very foundational philosophical question. We have a very easy answer. God created it. This is a real problem for evolution. Where did matter come from? Oh, the Big Bang. Okay, so that's going to be a problem we will address later. Creative Act number two is the origin of life, and I don't, I mean a life consciousness, not the plant life. This is the biological aspect of creation. You need to know where it is. It's in day five, but it's easy to find when you look for the verb create. Okay, this is the life consciousness that I mentioned earlier. But the important thing here to point out is this answers another <coughs> fundamental question for which evolution has very poor answer, and that is, how did life begin? Our answer is simple. God created it. It came from God. There's the law of biogenesis, that life only comes from life. It's too bad that evolution violates that basic law. So the creative act, number two. Then the third creative act, another significant event and another answer to a very fundamental, foundational question. It is the origin of man. The first creative act was the origin of matter and energy, the origin of the physical universe. The second was the origin of life. Where did life come from? How did it begin? And now the origin of man required a third creative act. This is the spiritual aspect of creation. This is day six. We don't find the, word, the verbs create until we get to day six. And this is where God created. And that's the proper use of the verb. Where God created. God created man's eternal spirit. And this answers the question, why is man different? Why is he different from the animal kingdom? What makes human beings so special? And the answer to that question is easy for creationists. It's easy for Christians because we know we were created in God's image and that implies we have a special place and we have a special purpose. Okay? So we are going to have our quiz on Thursday over the Genesis account. And also I want you to know the difference between creative acts and formative acts. All right, see you later.